Let's bow our heads for a moment. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to open your word together. And we especially ask for your blessing as we do. Speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. While Carol and I were wandering around the western part of the United States and back even into Oklahoma, uh, one of the sermons, in, the one in Oklahoma, was about uh, Gideon. And I wanted to jump off from the first verses in that story. Gideon is threshing out the wheat in the wine press because it's wheat season, not grape season, and he can hide down in there and maybe keep a little food to keep themselves alive. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And his answer was, If the Lord is with us, then why is all this happening to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? What's Gideon say? Where are all the miracles we've heard about? It turns out that even in the record of Scripture, miracles weren't every day for everybody all the time through the Bible. They had long stretches of history in Bible times where there wasn't that much happening. It didn't look that different from our age or from the Middle Ages or other times of earth's history for most of the people most of the time. God in, involved himself more actively at certain key times, times when big things were happening, big changes, uh, moments of transition for God and his people. Then you see more prophets, uh, more miracles. Uh, we, we have several prophets around the time of the flood. Uh, and then Abraham is a prophet, and there's a prophet when God establishes his people, Israel. Uh, when they came out of Egypt, Moses, and many, 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 many miracles there, which Gideon refers to in this story. And then during the times of the kings, as the, as the uh, northern and southern kingdoms separated, and the times of captivity around Babylon, and then Jesus' day, but in Jesus' day, there'd been a long stretch, like 400 years. Not much to say. Not much happening on the miraculous prophetic front. Was God gone? No, no, he wasn't gone. But he wasn't working in an overt way at those times. Jesus' life and the establishment of the Christian church, Book of Acts, full of miracles and a number of prophets. Um, and the next big event in biblical prophecy and history is, from our time, second coming. And we expect from the, the pattern of Scripture, God will again be more visibly active in this world than he has been at other times. This is a big moment. This is kind of the wrap up of the whole show here. Uh, don't expect it to go out without some evidence that God is alive and well and with his people. I was just reading the other day uh, in Adventist Frontier Missions Magazine. Some of you may get that, some of you may not. There's a, a, a story in here about a ministry for dreams and people who've had dreams and wonder what their dreams mean. And there's a real pattern in many of these dreams. Many of them are from people in the Islamic world. I'm going to quote a couple of them to you. That's why I ran back out to my car in the middle here. I remember this was still in my computer bag in the trunk, and I wanted to read it to you. Ahmad writes, I live in a Muslim country, not named here, I had a dream that I was going with my friend to Mecca. When we reached there, we found people running. So we asked, what's going on? We were told, there are a lot of evil spirits attacking people here. At first, I did not believe until I saw one running after me. Then a man in a white robe appeared and stopped the spirit and said, go to where you belong. 
Then he said, he told me, you do not belong here, follow me. I'm the way and the truth. Then I woke up. Please, can you help me? Who's the man dressed in white that says, I am the way and the truth? Who's that? That's Jesus. He's appearing in dreams frequently in the Muslim world. Two pages with little paragraphs of dreams from the Muslim world. Another one from Noor. I just had a dream. I saw a man in a white robe with a crown on his head. He looked at me and told me, follow me. I am the word of Allah, and I am the straight path that will lead you to paradise. There is no salvation without me. He said it with authority, but I could, I could see that he cares for me. I felt I was loved and accepted. Please, can you help me understand my dream? Thank you. Yeah, we, we can. We know who the word is. We know who the word is. I've had some question whether Allah is the true God or not. Some people say, no, he's not the true God. Others people say he is the true God. Um, here, the word of, of says he is the word of Allah. You know, yeah. Allah is the only word among Arabic Christians for God. Yeah, right. A and the fact that there are some misunderstandings about him in the, in the Islamic world doesn't mean he isn't the true God doesn't mean he isn't the true God. We have misunderstandings about God in the Christian world. doesn't mean he isn't the true God. Uh, they, they worship the God of Abraham, who is the creator of the world. That's the true God. Whatever understandings and misunderstandings we may have about him, he's the true God. Uh, and and uh, I had kind of come to that conclusion already, but this kind of affirms it. And there are others there. Is God busy in our world? Yes, he is. Uh, it's late in the history of our world, and God is busy, and he is not, he is not as hesitant to use his miraculous power as we sometimes think. It's happening around us more than we know. Uh, tomorrow, some of us are going to ride up to the constituency meeting uh, up, up in Mesa. And uh, a few years ago, riding up to a constituency meeting in Minnesota, I had three other people in my car were riding together. And on the way home, we got to talking about miracles. Miracles that we knew of, either by personal, we were involved, or we heard it directly from someone who was involved. We had about a two hour drive, and we didn't run out of things to share in a car of four. For two hours, we shared miracles we knew in our day, this world right now, that God is doing. One, just not on my notes, sorry, I'm going to put it in anyway. Uh, one of the pastors is in the next district up from me. Some years before, his wife had gotten quite sick and lost her hearing. And she was musical. And it was quite a trial. And the church prayed for her that God would restore her hearing. And her hearing was restored. And she also had perfect pitch now, which she didn't have before. And I said, wow, God puts his thumbprint on that one, doesn't he? Isn't that like God? Doesn't just fix it. He fixes it better than it was before. That's cool. That's cool. I really like that. Some of the stories that I got to share were from Bill Liversidge. Anybody heard of Bill Liversidge? Some of you know about Bill Liversidge. I thought there were some here. Uh, have you seen this book? The Sanguma Tree, it's some of his best stories written down by his son, but in the first person like his dad was telling the stories. I heard Bill Liversidge at some young pastor's training sessions, Union College, years ago. So I heard these stories right from his lips into my ears, and I want to share some of them with you today. Uh, I'm going to put a detail or two into the story, if I remember to, that isn't in the book, because it was when he told it in my ear. Uh, and I thought they were cool. So Bill was in uh, New Guinea 
as a missionary for eight or ten years uh, early in his uh, professional career. And, and while he was there, he, he saw a lot of the power of God, a lot of answers to prayer. Uh, God was active in the lives of the missionaries and, and the local workers, uh, and they needed him to be. They were in huge crises lots of times, uh, some things by coincidences of life and nature, but some because of opposition. Uh, they were in, in grave danger many times, and the Lord rescued them many times. Um, Bill and another missionary, overseas missionary, and a couple of local workers were on a walkabout. Uh, walkabout, you start on a tour, but you're walking because you can't drive lots of these places. Uh, they were on a walkabout, and they came through a village where the warriors were all dancing in a circle and quite worked up, um, wearing essentially nothing, but uh, the, there was a, a man squatting down in the middle of the circle by a little fire. Uh, it looked like it was the witch doctor, so uh, Bill, being very curious about what was going on, the local guys say, oh, this is Sanguma. Sanguma is the witchcraft power of animism used to cast spells and curses on other people and they even say you can kill people with this. Which reminds me of one day when my wife and I were volunteers in Borneo. I was standing talking to two of the teachers there uh, and, and uh, one of them said, oh, 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 oh. and I turned around to look, it was already gone. It was a fireball going through the sky. Uh, it starts with an egg and maybe a couple chopsticks, I can't remember, and some incantations, and, and the egg bursts into a fireball, flies through the air, and dives down on the residence of the target person and kills them. Except, if it is seen in transit, it doesn't do anything. Whew, that was a dud. <laughs> now, did I believe that or not believe that? I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, but there was some other evidences too that there's real power there that there is real power on the demonic side so Bill Liversidge back to him dodged through between the dancing warriors and squatted down by the, the uh, witch doctor asked him what are you doing oh I'm doing Sanguma well what does that do well there's a man in this other village and he's got a sweet potato there with some hair and fingernail pieces poked into the sweet potato. This is from the man. They're cursing. Okay? You always cut your fingernails in your hair by yourself and bury it so nobody can find it so they can't do sanguma on you if you live in those places. And he had done that carefully, but they had sent spies to watch him. And so they knew where he'd buried it, and they dug around until they found it, and they brought it back to the, pre, to the witch doctor, and he stuck it in the sweet potato, and wrapped a vine around the sweet potato, and he started to pull this vine as it's cooking. He's squeezing it in more and more and more and more, cutting into the sweet potato. And he says at first, oh, he says, I'm feeling sick, and he's telling his wife, I have sanguma. And Bill says to the guy, you don't believe that, do you? Yeah, yeah. On they go until finally he says, cuts it in truth. He says, Imi fellow, die penis. He just finished dying. And again, Bill says, Really? You don't believe that, do you? He says, hey, He's in such a village. Name's the village. Turns out it's about a half day walk away. So they spend the next half of that day walking to that village. Before they got to the village, you could hear the wailing and the shrieking of the people that said, Somebody died in that village. So when they got into the village, they said, who died? Named the man that the witch doctor named. When did he die? When the sun was about there. That was the time the witch doctor said he died. There is power on the other side. I was in the village of Kanganaman. Bill was walking around the village thinking, how do we reach a village like this for Jesus? How do we reach them? 
saw a tree he hadn't seen before. He'd been in New Guinea for several years at a minimum and knew most of what he was expecting to see. And this one was weird. It had huge fruits on it, kind of orangey red fruits. Walked over and he was about to touch the tree and a young boy from the village said, Oh, no, no, master, don't, no touch, don't touch. If you touch the tree, you'll die. Really? What's with this tree? That's a sanguma tree. And he looks again. Those aren't fruits. Those are bodies. Smoked and mummified and covered in bark and hung up in the tree. When anyone died of sanguma, they would mummify their body, smoking it over a fire, wrap it in the bark, and hang it in the tree. But only the witch doctor could touch that tree. If anybody else touched that tree, they would instantly die. Bill says to his companion, I got an idea. We touched the tree. That ought to prove something to him, right? And the other guy, I don't know, I don't know. Bill says, hey, I got a better idea. Let's sleep with our feet on the tree tonight. That'll give them time to think about it. The other guy says, I don't know. Bill says, okay, okay. How about you just sleep beside me? I'll put my feet on the tree. Okay, fine, he said. You do believe that God will take care of us? Yeah, I believe that. Okay, so they agreed they were going to sleep with Bill's feet on the tree that night. So they got out their sleeping bags when it was time to go to, go to sleep, and Bill is still hot. It's going to get cold. This is up in the mountains, but it hadn't got cold yet. So they're laying on top of the sleeping bags, and he stuck his feet on the tree, and it's like a jolt of electricity right through the village. like, ah! Everybody knows they're going to die. Well, somewhere in the night, as the night went on and things cooled down, they crawled inside their sleeping bags. And they heard drums in their village. Sending out a message over the hills. They didn't have any other communication in those days. Well before the age of the cell phone or telephone in those places, no other means of communication over distance except these drums. When Bill woke up in the morning, he says, I'm a slow riser. It takes me a while to come to and come around. He said, I could hear voices, lots of voices. Now, they had their heads under for protection from the bugs. And he whispers to the guy right next to him. He says, hey, you awake? Yeah, I never went to sleep. <laughs> he says, I think they think we're dead. Yeah. The other guy says, I figured that out a few hours ago. The drums were calling all the surrounding villages to come to the funeral and the smoking of the bodies of the stupid white guys who touched the San Guma trees the first time ever that they're going to smoke the bodies of white guys and put them up a San Guma tree. They came from villages far. There were hundreds of people in that village that morning. Bill says to his companion, let's pretend we're dead and see what they do. <laughs> the other guy says, I can't move anyway. He, he was scared stiff. Literally couldn't move. Well, the chief finally said to one of the young men in the village, go see if they're alive. He goes down and he touches the top of Bill's head. He says, they're all dead now. And the chief says, no, 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 no. You go back and you put your hand inside the sleeping bag and you check and see that they're really dead. So he came back to Bill and he pulled down the sleeping bag. They all wear pig grease and that's about all they wear. They put a little new pig grease on every day. That's how they clean themselves. Pig grease hand down over his face. And Bill sat up and said, boom! <laughs> and hundreds of people fled into the jungle. <laughs> and nobody, nobody. Bill and his buddy started laughing and laughing and laughing until his buddy said, what if they don't think it's funny? Because they've got poison arrows. And if they didn't like what you just did, it might have been the last joke you ever pulled on anybody. Fortunately, he says, 
they had a sense of humor. And they started laughing too. And everybody started laughing and laughing and laughing. And finally, the chief started toward Bill. Bill waved him over. Chief squatted down by Bill. And he said, how come if we touch that tree, we die? But when you touched it, you didn't. Mm. There was the opening Bill was looking for. They had seen the power of God. Before that day ended, the chief accepted Jesus. And in those days, in that culture, when the chief became a Christian, the village became Christian. It was a Christian village. They left the two native workers there. Three months later, they said it was a changed place. It was a fully Christian village converted by the power of God. And out of that village, native missionaries were trained and went to the Kuka Kuka tribe. That's the pygmies. The pygmies may be small, but you don't mess with pygmies. They were vicious. They were mean. Uh, they raided other villages. Uh, they, they, were, they were feared. And from the Kuka Kuka, Reuben became a Christian, went to our college. Uh, he still had anger issues. And they said it was an interesting thing at that college. Because they had representatives of all kinds of tribes there who still fought back in their villages. Hmm. Things got a little dicey sometimes. And one day Reuben uh, threatened to use his machete on somebody else right there in class. He got kicked out of class. And, uh, suspended. Bill called him in his office and said, Reuben, would you put your knife on my desk? So he did. He said, why don't you go back to your room and think about where your life is headed and ask Jesus to open your heart to him. Uh, so he, he left. He was back in 30 minutes. And Bill said, I could tell when he walked in, he was already chosen to change. So Bill led him to the foot of the cross right there. And Bill, uh, uh, Reuben, became one of the spiritual leaders on the campus Nobody else had to be afraid of him anymore. He wasn't going to swing his machete at you in class. He became safe to have around. Every year, their uh, theology students would go on walkabout, two by two. They would send them out to areas to, to practice what they've been learning in class, make it, make it real and practical. And Bill had been looking at one little island that had steadfastly refused to allow missionaries to land on that island. It was a small island. There were only two villages, and both chiefs and all the people on the island had agreed, no missionaries on our island. We don't want to change. We want to stay with our old ways. So Bill had been looking at that for a while, and he was telling the theology class, uh, this is the island I want to go to. Who, who should go with me? The whole class said, Reuben! Take Reuben with you. So Reuben and Bill headed for that island. Now they knew that the, that the chief was not going to give them permission to come on that island. So they decided that they would leverage a local custom, which was if you are in a village when the day ends, you may stay there even if they don't like you and don't really want you there, you can stay for the night and they can send you on tomorrow. But once you're there and the day is done, you can stay. So they carefully timed their arrival on the island for after dark. And they quietly sailed in with a little sail on their dugout canoe and found a little cove and hid the, the canoe under some branches and laid out their bags and turned in for the night. Bill said, I had the feeling we were being watched. And after a while, sure enough, there was guys standing all around them. He said, should have known you couldn't sneak up on an island like that and not be seen there watching everything all the time. And the chief had heard that they had landed, and they knew they were missionaries. How did they know they're missionaries? Well, only two kinds of people would try to land on their island, a missionary and a trader. What would a trader have with him? 
stuff to sell. These guys didn't have any stuff to sell. Obviously, they're not traders. They then have to be missionaries. We don't want missionaries. So in the middle of the night, the angry chief has them in his presence saying, why did you come to my island? Oh, oh so, so sorry, so sorry. But he knew better. He knew they were missionaries and they were trying to squeeze a chance into his island. So they said, well, okay, uh, if you really don't want us to be here, we'll leave first thing in the morning. He reluctantly agreed. But he wouldn't even let them stay in their village. He made them stay in a little hut that was half a mile away. The, the roof was only about so high. You had to duck to get in. And you got to share it with the big pig that was already there. And the fleas. And the rocks and the dirt floor. So they turned in there. Long about 3 o'clock in the morning, there's a shout in the jungle. You seven day, come. Me fellow all seven day, come. We need you seven day boys to come. Well, it was shouted from place to place up through the jungle. That was their telecommunication in those days. I tell it, you tell it. Uh, and so, you know, three o'clock in the morning, dark night. And Bill said, I really didn't like the pig snakes in the trees. So he said to Reuben, I'll stay here and pray. You run, find out what they want. He said, it pays to be the teacher. So Reuben ran down to the village, came back in about a half an hour and said, there's a young mother whose baby has the fever, presumably malaria, wants us to come pray for her baby. And the chief had agreed that she could have these Christian missionaries come down and pray for her baby. So they headed out in the night. Bill said he had to hang on to Reuben's arm. He couldn't see a thing. Reuben apparently could see. Uh, but Bill was seeing nothing. And he said they could see in the dark, it seemed like. And as they're getting close to the village, they hear the wails that say, mm, it's too late. It's too late. Bill's mind is spinning. Now what do you do? Now what do you do? We, we prayed that God would give us a chance this night to present him to this people before we have to leave in the morning. And we had the chance. We were going to pray for this sick baby, and now it's gone. Guess we have a funeral. About all you got to do. So Bill's thinking funeral as they walk in. The village was full of kerosene lanterns all over. That, that sick baby was the focus of the village. And they went to the little sick house, the clinic. It's a roof, thatch roof, no walls, dirt floor. That's it. And the doctor boy has malaria pills and aspirin. That's it. Um, they met the chief, and he said, thanks for coming. It's too late. Baby died about 20 minutes ago. Um, Bill's still thinking funeral. Reuben pushed past Bill right up to where the mother was standing, still holding her baby limp over her arms. She was very young. Yeah. Tears streaming down her face. Reuben held out his hands and took the baby and then held him up. Bill said, I I'd never seen this before, so I thought this was a local custom I didn't know about. At which point, he backed off and just stood at the edges. He said, I, I made it a point not to interfere with local customs I didn't understand. Uh, just see what's going to happen. Reuben lifted the baby up and started to pray. To the gist of, Lord, you gave life to this child. And now it's gone. But in your holy name, I'm asking you to give his life back. Bill's watching. He said, I thought I saw a flicker in a leg, but he said, no, nah, it's just the light. But then both legs started to kick, and the baby cried. 
And the mother let out a shriek, rushed over, grabbed the baby, kind of shook the baby. The baby was definitely alive. Everybody in that village knew that baby was dead. They saw it with their own eyes. Everybody in that village knew that baby was resurrected. They saw it with their own eyes. That village was never the same again. The gospel had arrived on their island. I told that story at blind camp in Minnesota a few years ago. A young blind girl, I'd say 10 or 11 years old, afterward, she said, I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe. Someday she also will be healed by the same power of the same God that gave life back to the baby in New Guinea. That's not the only resurrection that has happened in my lifetime that I've heard about. We had a guest at uh, Wisconsin Camp Meeting. I'm trying to remember who it was. I think maybe he worked for Adventist World Radio. You remember, Carol? Um, he told about a friend of his who was one of the workers in Africa uh, who told him this story but said, you cannot use my name if you tell this story. I don't want my name attached to it. Uh, it will be a hindrance if it is, and you'll see why. One day he was driving through traffic in the city there in Africa, and he hears a voice that says, turn left at the stop sign, at the stoplight. So he turned left. The stoplight. Driving down the street, said, Stop in front of that house right over there. So he stops in front of that house. And a very distressed man comes out of the house. Said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? His wife just died. He's got a bunch of kids. What would you do if God sent you to that house right there? So he went in and he prayed that that wife would be restored to life, and she was. He said, that's happened four more times. That's why he didn't want his name used. You don't want to become the man of resurrections. <laughs> that will fill your days. That would fill the rest of your life if that became how you were known. Later, he became a teacher at uh, Adventist College in Africa. And he's teaching young pastors about the power of prayer. He didn't tell them that he's seen five resurrections. But what he did tell them is, there's nothing God cannot do when we pray. Nothing God can't do. Where's the God of miracles? Well, the God of miracles is where he's always been, doing what he's always done. And he intervenes whenever it is important to do so, and he does it in the ways that are important to do. Some years ago, I, I used to kind of feel sorry for myself, I guess. Maybe I whined a little to God that nothing miraculous ever happened in my life. I mean, here's Nebuchadnezzar. He's a pagan, heathen king, and God sends him dreams and fiery furnace, all this stuff that God does for Nebuchadnezzar. I never have anything like that happen to me feeling kind of sorry for myself. <laughs> Spirit said to me, you don't need that. <laughs> I did it for him because he needed it. If you needed it, I would. You don't need that. You've got everything I got for, did for him and everybody else in Scripture. You've got what you need. If I need to do that kind of thing for you, I will. I will. If I don't, it's because I don't need to. <laughs> Kind of humbled me a little there. I quit whining. I quit whining. Because it's true. God's given us what we need. He will work a miracle when he needs to. He's given us records of miracles. Even in our own days, we have miracles. This is not an age that is void of miracles. There are miracles all around. I, 
I think we need to have our faith clear and firm. God can do anything, but he won't necessarily do everything. His call, his call. Let God be God. Don't tell him what to do. Tell him what we'd like. <laughs> That's fair enough. That's always fair enough. Tell him what we'd like. But let it be his call. If it's for his honor, and it was, to raise that baby in New Guinea, many Christians came of that. Without an evangelistic meeting, without a Bible study, without a sermon, they all knew who the real God was that day. They all knew. That's, that's better than anything we can do. And when God gets a chance like that, he doesn't often pass it by. Doesn't often pass it by. So, I almost titled it, Where is the God of Miracles? Quoting from Gideon. He is the God of miracles. He is the God of miracles. Always has been, still is. Now, interestingly, the miracles we experience now are all temporary, you understand. That's something that was late coming to my thinking. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he lived a normal life on this world after that and died again. Uh, by now, the baby in, in New Guinea is probably a, a well-matured person, may have already come to the end of his normal lifespan or be close to that, will presumably die again like all others who have been raised in this life uh, with, a, with a couple of exceptions, Moses raised and taken to heaven, Elijah taken without seeing death. Um, but there is the day when God fixes all of the effects of sin for everybody. When Jesus comes back, there's no more of any of that for anyone, anywhere, ever again. No sickness, no crying, no sorrow, no death, no pain. Hard to imagine a world like that, but I like the picture. I love the promise. And that's what God assures us will be true for all his people. His power will restore everything on a permanent basis, and that will be soon. Let's be open to his using us as tools in that process. Lord, thank you that you are still the God who has the power to do anything you choose. Help us to remember that. Help us to relate to that carefully and faithfully, letting you be God, but also remembering we can ask you for whatever seems good in Jesus' name, trusting that you know what is best to do that there's nothing you can't do, and you've proven it. We trust that you will cure all the ills of this earth in your kingdom. Start with our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.